So can ChatGPT take on AP Physics 1? This is the question I really wanted to answer. So within the last few months, um, ChatGPT has enabled the ability, or ChatGPT4 specifically, has enabled the ability to attach files and read in documents as well as understand images or at least interpret some things. And I was like, look, what could I throw at it to figure out can it do a decent job? So I thought I would take the 2023 free response questions, load the document in, and then see what kind of answers it spit out and actually grade it, go through the scoring guidelines and grade its answers to see how well it did. So let me show you what um, I ended up doing here. So if you look at this, here I have a tab of, of what I gave. I literally opened up the PDF from College Board, took the past free response questions, and this is the prompt I gave it. I just pretend you're a student, go through, answer each question as they did. Now, I did a pretty good job on the first pass. Unfortunately, some of the things like sketching and things like that, it didn't quite answer correct, or it didn't give me an answer. So then I had to prompt it a little bit more. I said, you didn't answer some of the questions. So free response, like I, I, I labeled that specifically ones, which ones did it answer, which ones did it not answer. Um, and I did do that. And then I, I, I try to have it clarify exactly what, how to specify those things. So it did do that. And then the last thing I realized is the paragraph answer question, which is a notoriously difficult one, is one where it was like really brief on the explanation. So what I did then did was I said, hey, I don't think you understand what is exactly is required from a paragraph answer. So I went ahead and loaded in the exam course and exam description, which describes the entire document that explains everything that's taught in AP Physics 1 and the guidelines. And then all I did was tell it again. I was said, hey, for free response number four, you didn't provide sufficient explanation. Read the document, understand the guidelines, then answer. And then it gave me a much clearer answer or a better one. And so um, I wanna go through all of them. So I'm gonna take all of these. You don't have to read all of this. I did it all for you. Um, um, oh, I, I actually it had a one mistake. It didn't answer the correct question. So I, I told it to do it again. And um, I tried a little bit clarity on like, hey, I know you can't graph from me, but hey, can you tell me what you would you would graph on there? So um, I did all that, and so let's take a look. So I pulled up all of their answers. I have the scoring guidelines over here, and then I have um, the, the answer. So let's kind of go through um, the answers that they have here. Okay, so this first question is a mass on a spring system, and I, um, so it said uh, on the graph, um, explain why this is true and it said that well hey it looked at this graph look it actually read the graph and it said that the k versus potential energy indicate that the maximum kinetic energy max potential energy this because um, due to conservation of energy which is correct all right so it gets a point for that one um, so then it asked, okay, it did a calculation here for this, the frequency of oscillation what is required in this question for using the equation for frequency or period of a ratio Good job with that one. And then it did calculate it and look at, it calculated one half here by doing the computation and one half is the correct answer. So it did a pretty good job with that one. Um, let's take a look at this one. Actually, uh, so this one, um, this one's a little tricky because you're supposed to, one, well, you could explain why the, uh, the graphs are the same uh, because the total kin kinetic energy remains independent of mass. And this is the example response. The maximum potential energy system does not depend on the mass of the system. Therefore, will be no change when the block is added. So that is correct. I think that's a good explanation. Here's where, it, you know, like when you ask it to sketch a graph, uh, it, it, it didn't give me an answer the first time. Here's where I had to like specify a little bit more about like what to do. So um, I wanted it to tell me exactly how to draw it. Cause I was like, well, you can't draw it, but at least tell me if I were a student, what I should draw on there. Um, he said a new graph line, a solid line, will be beneath the original line. So he knows it's a straight line. Um, it will not reach as high as the kinetic energy axis because the maximum kinetic energy. And then I asked him to give me specific values. Um, well, when I was saying, like, give me the specific numbers for the graphing. He said if it originally was 10 and 10, which it misread this part. It didn't, you know, it should have been 4 and 4 in terms of reading. The new maximum would be 2.5. So it knew that it should be 1 quarter of the original value and it knows that it, and it knew that the potential would stay the same. So it at least answered correctly that the potential energy would be the same 
and the kinetic energy would be different, like a straight line. And it did say a straight line like that. So I actually would go ahead and say like, it did a pretty good job on this. The one mistake it made was it it, it didn't actually read the four joules on here. It kind of made up a num another number, but I think it like got to the point where I was generous enough to say like, okay, I would give you, because it can't really do the drawing, um, I'll give you seven out of seven for that one. Okay, so that's kind of, um, this is the one it did the best on for sure. Um, oops, I kind of spoiled this because I graded it the first time, but I messed up my audio when I was editing it. So I had to redo this. Anyway, so let's take a look at um, this one. What quantities would we want to uh, sketch? And it said it did um, X versus time squared um, because X equals one half AT squared. So indicated two quantities, position, time squared, almost give the exact same answer as um, the, the scoring guideline. Um, for this one, let's take a look. Um, the two points from so this one is another scenario where it's like it couldn't really, it, it wouldn't really generate the numbers. It would only tell me how to generally do it. Okay, so it couldn't sketch it. So it wouldn't, it, it's not able to do that, which I will penalize it for because it's not perfect, right? So it's not good at sketching. It couldn't plot the data points. It wouldn't compute it. Drawing the best fit line, it couldn't do that. Here, it is attempting to find the slope. It does say to use the slope calculation here. Okay, so I would say, I, you know, it attempted it. And using the slope of a valid kinetic equation, it knew that the acceleration would be twice the slope. So I would grant it that, given that it couldn't actually plot the data on the graph. Um, you probably wouldn't, if you were to answer it this way, you probably wouldn't get this credit on, but I'm, I, I know the limitation of the chat GPT has, it is some limited, but it did know what it, what you ought to have done if it could understand the points on the graph and doing that straight line there. Um, let's see. So he actually does a great job with this one. So part B, um, for indicating quantity to be measured, the angle, he says to find, measure the angle of the ramp. So got a point for that for finding a correct relationship between the G, the experimental G and that, that would also be correct. So it did a perfect job on that part here. Students claim that this is wrong. He could say the angle or inclination of the ramp. Um, he ought to have said a physical error in the measurement. That's what he probably would say. I'm gonna go ahead and give him the point um, because that is a physical factor. I think he was just saying that like maybe the angle was wrong or a little bit different in some ways so that that I think is um, sufficient. I think it's specific enough um, on that point. And he did a co correct uh, conclusion as to how the physical reason would lead to a decrease. A smaller angle results in a lower component of gravitational force along the ramp, reducing it. So I thought he did a good job with that one as well. Um, this one, another one is a scenario where he could not like sketch it very well. So I didn't, couldn't give him any points for this, unfortunately. Um, he described it reasonably well. I tried to force it to describe it. He said it starts at the bottom, decreases to a minimum, and returns to the starting point. So he was kind of doing, kind of starting here, decreases to a minimum. So he was kind of indicating something like this, which is valid, but it didn't specify the concavity or anything. So, you know, I know it can't draw, but like, I don't think that was sufficient, unfortunately. And then um, this one, and then it goes back to, like, it starts at zero, decreases. This one was kind of interesting. He said that it started at zero velocity, and then it, it decreases as he goes up. So I didn't really grant him a lot of credit on that one, so I think those two points he didn't get. Um, but overall, one, two, three, four, five, six. I would say give him seven points on the uh, experimental, uh, or yeah, the experimental design. One, let me, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, seven points. So pretty good job on number two. Not perfect, but pretty good. Let's look at number three here. So I, I had trouble having him draw the free body diagram part. That's what you're required to do on this part. So um, the way he described it is the force, so I, I asked him to say like, hey, which way would I draw the arrow? He says the force arrows should point away from the equilibrium position toward the center spring attachment. Now in this problem, that would be to the right from the from their toward, from the equilibrium position towards it. But um, so I went to get him granted a point for that one. And then he would say that the force at T2 should be longer than T1, the length of the arrow T2 being longer than T1. So also did a good job with that part there. 
um, for an explanation that refers to the difference in the length. So why did he say that? He said the force exerted by the spring increases and stretches more so that the arrow should be longer. So I think that's perfectly, that's a perfectly good explanation. That's exactly correct. And that's why it is longer there. Um, this one, he gets completely wrong. Kind of a bit weird here. He talks about conservation of angular momentum. I think he was thinking of a more, maybe a little bit complicated scenario, but definitely um, definitely not correct on any of these. So he lost those three points for just not being able to do this part correctly here. Um, part B, let's see. Uh, derivation was actually not too bad. He gets, for part I, he did F net equals K zero D, and that is exactly correct. The second one, it's pretty close. Um, this is one thing that I found is he just spit out an answer. He didn't derive it. And I think derive is kind of um, not a word he understands. I think you would, if I gave him more parameters as like saying, oh, hey, when I mean derive, I mean show your steps for it. Um, he could have gotten more points, but unfortunately he didn't show any work for that there. And he didn't even get the right answer. Um, L plus D is necessary instead of just he did D, which would have been a very common mistake to just have D and B there, but it's L plus D is the radius of the circle. So, um, you know, makes a little bit of a mistake on that point, um, analytically. Um, this part, he said, um, this part was actually good, his quantitative. He said, does the equation for tangential speed release? He said, yes, the derived speed shows that V is proportional to the square root of D, consistent with the larger D, which is a larger greater force and thus greater speed. So I think he was correct at those two points. Did a correct, did a great job explaining, you know, why that this derived equation, despite being wrong, shows the correct dependency between the distance and the the speed, as well as the conclusion there. So, um, actually, oh, okay. So now I take that back. He he attempts to do this. I actually can't give him this point because he assumed that um, v1 was greater. See, on this answer, he said v1 was greater than v2, but he actually uh, contradicts himself in there. So actually, I would say he attempted to correct the dependency, but he actually forgot that he got this one wrong. So um, unfortunately, it's not consistent with his answer up here. So lost that consistency a little bit. So one, two, three, four, five. This is five out of 12 on this one for this quantitative quantitative translation. So um, not too bad, a little bit worse on that FRQ. And then this one, um, FRQ4, he actually does a pretty good job with. Um, if you look at this, he does this calculation for the angular acceleration. He gets two FT over MR, perfectly correct. Um, for this one, I did have to ask him to actually do a whole paragraph. His first answer was like one sentence. And then that's when I loaded in the the course exam description document told him, hey, read this document and answer the paragraph answer according to the instructions there. And then it spit out this giant thing. I think it's a little excessive, but he does a really good job at this point. So angular momentum is the product of those things for a constant force applied over a fixed time is the same for both the disc and the hoop. So he says that this is the same between the two since torque is this. Okay, so he, he explains that torque. Um, he says the change in angular momentum is the same, therefore. However, the distribution of the mass, and he calculates the rotational inertia between the disc and the hoop here. He says they are different. And then he says he gives a good reasoning. A smaller moment of inertia means that the, the disc for the same angular impulse achieves a higher angular velocity compared to the hoop. So he gets, talks about how it's going to spin faster. And then since the rotational kinetic energy is one half K omega squared, he's relating those to indicate why that is. And that was logical. And I thought that was a really, really good explanation here uh, of that. So, you know, just had to give him a little bit of prompting on how a paragraph answer would by just loading in the course and exam description. And then he was able to figure that out. So, you know, he actually did really good on that seven out of seven for that FRQ. Now, number five is actually probably the one that's most visual and trickiest to understand. He does very, very poorly on this FRQ, to be honest. Um, so what ends up happening is you have this scenario where this rod is rotating here. Let's take a look at what he ends up getting right and what he gets up getting wrong. So first, he says, which one has uh, the greatest angular acceleration? He says it's the highest torque, which is at the vertical position frame A. That's incorrect. The torque would be greatest at frame C, so gets that one wrong. Um, let's see. For, and then, um, for correctly rating torque and angular acceleration, that the angular acceleration, actually he gets a point for that, for at least saying that, 
um, even though he got the wrong frame. He understood that torque and angular acceleration were related. Um, there. Okay, so maximum rotational kinetic energy is frame C due to conver conversion from potential to kinetic energy. That is incorrect because um, at the lowest point down here would be the correct. The correct answer was frame E. So that was just one point. But So he lost two points on that one. Um, this one, I actually told him to do a full derivation. So I actually had him do the work here um, in addition to the answer because he just spit on the answer. But I I, this is where I was like, hey, Give me an actual derivation. Don't just give me an answer, but actually when I say derivation, derive it. So um, he does correctly use conservation of energy. He inco incorrectly uses the, 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 the height. He's like kind of, because he's using conservation of energy here. He uses the height as three quarters L, which is really easy to tell, but you got to remember it started up here and it didn't understand that part. It started, he thought it went from there to there, which is a very common way to read that diagram. I would expect some students to maybe think about that but it actually started up here so the change in height was incorrect that's pretty subtle that's a little bit tricky and i can see why it might have a hard time understanding that it started here given that the figure didn't explain that it only explained it in words and in context on the previous scenario of where it started there okay um however i can give him credit for this because it is consistent with the with the, you know he put three quarters l and his answer is consistent with that. So that part I can give him a point for. Okay. And um, all right, cool. Um, and then this last part here is the rod sphere system gains kinetic energy due to conver conversion of gravitational to kinetic energy, even though Earth is involved. This is not a good answer because the Earth's not included in the system. In, in, in the way the College Board handles um, systems is you're not really supposed to talk about gravitational potential energy unless the Earth is part of the system because it's an external force. You think of it as work. Although I will say that a lot of physics textbooks don't necessarily do it the way that College Board treats systems in AP Physics 1. So it's very, I can totally understand why ChatGPT got confused here or continues to use that because there's many textbooks, there's many physics teachers who would still say to use gravitational potential energy when the Earth's not in the system. However, that is not how College Board, that is not the rubric, that is not the way it is taught in this class. And so um, he doesn't get this point. But what he said in here is somewhat reasonable, but it is not correct in the in the sense. You know, this question, I actually didn't tell him to use the course and exam description. Maybe if I did, it would understand a little bit better or answer it in a better way. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, so overall, uh, this one I did the worst on one, two, maybe three. Three out of seven points here. So if we look at this, three plus seven is ten. 10 plus 5, 15, 15 plus 7, 22, and then 22 plus 7, 29. 29 out of 45 points. That's not too shabby, okay? It's a lot better than I thought he would actually end up doing. 29 out of 45 points, and that is, um, oops, 29 divided by 45 is 64%, 64.4%. That's actually a pretty solid score. That's a, that would probably be a four on the AP exam, assuming that he did the multiple choice questions too. So um, did a pretty good job, honestly, with the answers. I actually would um, score it much, much higher than I thought it was gonna, gonna do. Clearly has some gaps, not perfect, but a far improvement. You know, you gotta remember when ChatGPT started out, it couldn't even understand images. It probably would have bombed this, but now that it can take a document, read the images, and do a reasonable job at reading the graphs and interpreting the question and understanding a good portion of the scenario based on context, I thought it did a really, really good job with that. So let me know what you guys think, if you guys found this really interesting or not. Um, you know, um, maybe maybe next one I can actually make it do one of the College Board practice tests and just see how it answers the multiple choice questions and what it actually scores on that. I couldn't show the questions necessarily, but I could show you maybe what the score it got. If that's something you'd be curious in, or um, anyway, let me know if there's uh, anything else you'd like to see.